Bill is going to speak on the um, architecture of the, the domestic architecture of Washington County, and he's the person to do so, working for the New York State Division of Historic Preservation. And one of his uh, main responsibilities is to evaluate all the homes that are being considered for uh, the Register of Historic Places. So he knows his stuff. He's also, like us, very uh, keen on what we have here, the good stuff we have here in Washington County. So I'm sure he will have a lot of uh, nice insights to share with us. Um, thank you all for coming out. Mr. Prattinger. Great. Yours. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I've been fortunate. Um, well, sometimes working for the state is uh, both a blessing and a curse. Uh, but I'm very fortunate in my job. Um, over nearly, hard to believe, 15 years now. Um, I think I've represented half of New York's counties for the National Register Program. So I've really gotten a lot of exposure to the architecture, not only of our region, but other areas of the state, which is great you know, for comparative purposes uh, in particular, um, because the way someone builds a house up here in 1780 and the way they build a house in Rockland County in 1780 are a lot, a lot different. Um, I'm going to put some program objectives here. Um, the talk probably about 45 minutes or so. The second I see the first set of eyes closed, I usually accelerate from there. Um, Sally Brion's not here. Um, we're going to discuss both these houses moving forward. Uh, one is the Wilson House on the right on Chamberlain Mills Road in uh, Hebron, and the other is the doorway uh, from the Door House in, in Cambridge, one of my favorites. But uh, let's look at a few uh, objectives. Um, what I'd like to discuss uh, tonight, uh, provide an overview of Washington County's domestic architecture from settlement period to circa 1830. Uh, 1830, you might say, well, that's sort of a, a random date, um, but it's really a, a period of transition. That's really when, when, especially in rural areas of New York State, the Greek Revival period really begins uh, in earnest. So I use it sort of as a cutoff point uh, in our discussion tonight. Consider how Washington County's early house architecture was shaped by two principal influences, uh, the New World Dutch and the New England traditions. Uh, one of the great things about this region is this is not a homogenous population in early date. It's very diverse. We have two building traditions, really, with a Dutch sort of Germanic, New World Dutch, we'll call it, tradition, which comes up the Hudson River. Then we have the influence of the New Englanders. And sometimes, as we'll see, uh, these traditions merge uh, in terms of the framing, way houses are laid out. Uh, we'll discuss a particular instance uh, of that. Um, and also look at the transition from really what we'll call sort of settlement period and, and folk architecture to houses which reflect sort of national trends and architectural styles. So really the movement out of a, really a frontier culture uh, into uh, something more advanced or, or urbane. This is something uh, I, I can guarantee you've never seen um, because this didn't survive past about 1800, which is hard to believe. Um, this is, uh, I'm showing this as an example of something that uh, is a superlative and really not representative of the experiences of people in Washington County at an early date. Uh, this is Judge Dewar or William Dewar's house. It was at Fort Miller. Uh, it was built in the 1770s. Uh, Dewar came uh, to America intent on basically setting up a plantation uh, under the advisement of Philip Schuyler. Uh, he set up a new house in Mills uh, at Fort Miller. Um, his idea was he was going to supply the Royal Navy with, uh, you know, the usual thing, masts, tar, pitch, rosin. So he had this tremendous uh, piece of architecture built. Uh, Dewar lives there but a few years because uh, by 1777 we're in the midst of a war. This house is probably better known as the headquarters of General John Burgoyne and before him Frazier as they were coming down uh, the Champlain Valley into our neck of the woods and it's the house where uh, basically Burgoyne, Burgoyne really uh, came to realize what his fate was going to be. I show it because it, it's really something where we see more in like the middle Atlantic states. This five part formula, you got the big hip roof house, you got hyphens, you got dependencies. Um, this does not really represent uh, how people are living in Washington County at, in the 1770s. Sure, yeah, hyphens. So this is a main block here. That's, that's the center of the house. These are usually called uh, flankers or dependencies. And these are hyphens which provide connection between those. So it's a really very grand scheme, a very Georgian Palladian scheme, like I say, this thing didn't last long because Dewar, um, he moves, he's living in Albany really not five or 10 years after this, his land agent's living here. By about 1800, this house is a derelict and it's actually taken down for salvage. And what's said about it 
is that the timbers from the house were used to build four other things that are still standing in Fort Miller, we think. So a uh, very short uh, uh, period. This is really how people live, though, uh, you know, in the beginning here. This is right out of Chris Field Johnson, the Beatty Farm in Salem. The reason I show it is because it shows, and I don't know how, is, is that clear enough? And the reason I show it is because it shows, it shows the settlement period log house here and how they've sort of just added and it's been incorporated into the later construct. I haven't seen a lot of these in Washington County where you still see them. This is in Clinton County outside of Plattsburgh. We're just driving down the road. Say, is that a log house? Um, that's really how people live. That, that's your frontier sort of uh, accommodation. Asa Fitch has provided a tremendous amount of information. Yeah. Is there a farm house still there? I don't know, and that's one thing I didn't get to look. Is, is this here? The baby house? Is still here, and is, is, is the log house still incorporated? You live in it. All right, let's get in the car and go. All right, this is good news. We'll, we're going to do a little visit to your house. My, okay, my, my, my point being that basically people are coming here. This is a true frontier. Um, people are coming out of the hill towns in Massachusetts, other areas. You're looking to put something up pretty quick. Log house, 20 by 20, sometimes a little smaller. Very crude sort of dwelling. Not a lot of these survive. Um, they did survive, we know, pretty well into the 19th century because Hartford, as you all probably know, was called Log Village on the 1866 map. Log Village, pretty, pretty remarkable. So there was enough of these buildings still there. So unlike Dewar, this is probably more likely what people are living in uh, at an early date. Uh, in Salem, also on Hanks Road behind the Cape House there, we have the McAllister, um, which is not a, a log house, but a frame house, but the same idea, small single room structure. I've only been in that once. I would love to go back and, and, and spend a little more time in that. Now we're going to look at some sort of typologies, you've, you've, you know, types you've seen uh, in your own driving around the county probably. What I'm trying to do is just try to inform some of what you see. Now one of the early building types we see is the story and a half house. And we call it a story and a half because basically we have our first story here. And then we have this little knee wall upstairs. Um, sometimes with the lean-to on the back, as these two examples show. Very common house form in the 18th into the early 19th century. There are plenty of them uh, throughout Greenwich, Cambridge, Hebron. Um, and what we're going to see is this, this is really showing the influence of, of Dutch culture and Dutch architecture on this region. Um, it is, it's not a domestic type that we affiliate with New Englanders. This is something that's, that's coming, up, coming up the river. And you know, you look at Easton, uh, Easton was very Dutch. Uh, all the farms along the river were Dutch, Dutch families, Van Buren's um, among them, and parts of Cambridge, certainly in White Creek. I mean, there was no shortage of influence uh, at an early date. Some of these survive, and you'll see them and you say, oh, it looks sort of Greek revival. You see the pilasters on it, see some of the trim, you know, little freeze band windows. This is on Christie Road in Greenwich. Same thing, about, built about 1800, I was in this house. It retained a little bit of that earlier finish work, but distinctive, usually it has a very steep, it's the roof pitch that often gives these away. You know, our Greek revival stuff assumes a real temple sort of pitch. You see this little higher pitch to these. Um, the Van Buren House and River Road in Easton is like this. The Maxwell House or, or O'Donnell Hill House in Jackson. You see these with Greek revival trim, but they're built 50 years earlier. Um, and the idea really of the gable-ended linear house, center entrance, that's an earlier sort of domestic conception. We know really by about the 1830s, they start to rotate the house gable forward very often. And this, let's trace it back to where, where is this form coming from? And it is like what we call a new world Dutch house. Timber frame building, story and a half, often with a lean-to. If you don't know, a lean-to is just this little extension of space. Uh, we, a salt box, as some people call it, often has a, a, a straight pitch. The Dutch often, they, it's called a broke back lean to here, how there's variation. But really what's distinctive and what defines these New World Dutch houses is the way they're built. Uh, they're built with what we call H bents. Uh, bents are a series of closely spaced posts and corresponding tie beams. So it's sort of a modular system. You can see the spacing here, which then defines window and door openings. And in the early versions, really before the revolution, these beams are exposed. They're plain, smooth, and they're exposed in the Dutch house. Very, it's really a wonderful system, very simple, and it exposes really the guts of the house in a, in a uh, really a structural and aesthetic sense. What's interesting about this house, you'd say, that's ah, probably maybe in Columbia or Dutchess County. This is in Pownall, Vermont. 
one of these sort of, we know we had a really sort of indefinite border between New York and parts of New England. Um, this obviously is, is probably attributed to that. But it shows that this system, this, this New World Dutch system, it extends into Washington County, goes into Saratoga County. It has wide influence because at this time, people are, the builders are itinerants and they're often moving from place to place. So these ideas spread. But this is really the genesis of this, this story and a half house type. Good example, late example. Um, Lee Foster from Shushan was taking this house down on Hedges Lake. Uh, my wife and I actually bought this frame. What is it? It's an example of the same exact thing. Um, as you see, every one of these uh, ceiling beams is framed into a post. Late example of the type, really scrawny little posts by then. They're like six by six. So this is a pretty late example of the type. But here we have it in Jackson. Hey, what's this Dutch stuff doing here? Well, you know, this influence was pervasive in, in southern Washington County. It's stored now, waiting to re-erect it, basically, as part of another house, which you will see in this talk, too. <laughs> So that's our friends, the Dutch, as we know, um, you know, the building trades uh, sometimes, you know, it's Salem is interesting because Salem is our earliest sort of settled place in Washington County. At the time of the revolution, it's the most densely populated place. But if you're looking to build something, if you're someone like uh, John Williams, you might import guys from Albany to build. I mean, this stuff happens all the time. So uh, as my, my point being, it's, it's not really that unusual that this influence is there. And we had Dutch barns in Washington County too, but I think they are all gone now. Okay, now we have to talk about our, our friends, the Yankees, um, because that is the other great tradition, and um, we see plenty of uh, New England influence, uh, not surprisingly. I think this is Windsor, Vermont, a great historic picture of uh, basically a center chimney cape, pretty established uh, domestic form from Long Island all the way up uh, into upstate New York, uh, in New England as well, probably a little woodshed. Um, and we, we know we have plenty of New Englanders coming into this area. Look at the half of the Salem party that settles the Turner Patton are coming out of the hill towns, are coming out of Pelham, Colerain, other areas like that. One thing that's interesting is they often say Salem settled by the, you know, the Scotch-Irish contingency of you know, Clark's people and then the New Englanders. The New Englanders were actually Scotch-Irish too, who had been in Londonderry and were migrating through Massachusetts before they arrived there. Point being, though, they've been in uh, New England long enough to absorb how people build and how they live, and then they're bringing these ideas uh, on into Washington County with them. Much different um, concept in terms of how uh, you build your house, both in terms of the structure, uh, the timber frame, and, and the layout. Uh, obviously, the dominant feature, um, and, and this is real folk housing. There are some other uh, variations. We're not going to see every single house type that New Englanders build. But you'll note what is really the prevailing feature of these buildings. It's a center chimney. It's a center chimney mass that really defines these houses. And the frame is really built around that. Um, this cape plan, which we'll see a little bit later, um, is actually a really efficient plan. And, and we've, we have found examples of this house where you walk in, cramp stair, two parlors, range of rooms across the back. We see people still using this plan without a center chimney. We just found an example in, I think, Shenango County from like 1830. Great house plan, but you see both in terms of the way the frame is built, it's a box frame as opposed to an H-bent Dutch frame um, with really that, that mass, that center chimney mass heating the whole thing. Great in the winter, probably not so great in the summer when you need to cook in there. So obviously the other thing is New Englanders usually build a one-story house or a two-story house. That in-between thing is, is really New World Dutch. Okay, up in the Hebron, I don't know uh, how many know Sally Brian or know this house, but it's, it's a really iconic example of the type. Sorry, I gotta stop for a sip here. I think the Wilsons came out of Rhode Island, build um, really a type of house we'd expect from New Englanders at this time. Although keep this house in mind in the date because in a little while we're gonna look at some high style houses which are also built at this time, which veer away from this sort of folk tradition to something much more formal. All the hallmarks, center chimney, uh, you enter in, staircase in front of you, the two parlors with fireplaces, kitchen in the rear room, usually a buttery or a pantry on one side and a small bedroom on the other side. So it's a really typical house plan, both for the one and two story houses. Call these salt boxes, I don't particularly care for that uh, terminology, but you do see one of the features of the house is it is extended with the, you know, what's basically a shed roof off the back. 
Yeah, I think it resembled an old time, old time salt box, basically. But it's 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 terminology. I don't personally care for it, but it does have resonance. People say salt box, and you know exactly what they're talking about. But I think there was an old time salt box that had that profile. Yeah, I mean, typically most most people who were coming here were, you know, looking for opportunity, and you know, especially people coming out of the hill towns of Massachusetts. I mean, if you've ever driven out there, it's not really a lot of good farmland. Um, we know a lot of these people, I think Turner and Conkey who come here, they've served in the French and Indian War. What has happened is they're going through this region to go to Lake George and other areas and they're seeing this place and they're saying, you know, look at the virgin timber, look at this arable land. This is a place we need to come to. So it's really their military experience that exposes them to this place. But these are people who are just looking for a good piece of arable land in a lot of ways. I'd say typically that's what a lot of these people are doing. No, uh, there, there, there's a few William Doers, but most of these are sort of your average everyday folks. Well, there's a substantial mill complex, and we are going to look at, um, and I don't know if the Wilsons were associated with that. That I can't remember. Do you know that offhand, Keith? Later. Later they were, okay. Yeah, and Chamberlain Mills becomes a huge, uh, there's a huge mill complex there. And actually, we're going to look at a house type and a house that, that's born directly of that. Here's, here's just another variation of that plan. This, this, this stair isn't, isn't typical, uh, but once again, the standard layout, probably a parlor on one side, what would serve as a dining room, but also as sort of a sitting room on the other side. Your kitchen across the back, typical you know, bake oven, cooking hearth, pantry on one side, and a room often reserved as a bed chamber on the other side. And that's your you know, Connecticut River Valley, New England center chimney house plan. Um, you see that on the one-story capes. You see it in the two-story houses as well. Um, and even earlier, they don't even have this. They have a hall and parlor house is what it's called. So this is sort of an evolution of the New England house, where sometimes you have just this and this, and then they add the back. Two examples uh, of the type. I haven't looked at this house. This is down almost to, um, man, that, that's way down there, um, Valley Falls. It's still in Cambridge, um, near Durfee Road. Um, I don't know a lot about the early history, but it's a pretty pure example of the type, single story, center chimney. Uh, this was on McCormick Road. This is gone now. Um, I think it was, it was taken down. I think it, its parts were just um, used for other applications. I don't think it was rebuilt. That one uh, really reads, you know, you, you take away the tree and the landscape. That, that could be in Suffolk County, you know, that, that has a real look of a, a real New England coastal, coastal cape. Yeah, I don't know what became of McCormick Road, but we asked. All right, so, so we, we know sort of the plan, how people lived in the houses. We should talk a little bit about, you know, how the houses are finished, you know, how they evolve. Um, Alan, I think I took this when I was looking at the uh, flat house with you. Um, and we'll, we're going to consider that house in a, in a moment. Really in the 1780s, um, into the early 1790s, you know, the characteristic treatments are paneled walls. I mean, that's really, you don't see as much use of plaster, uh, fielded panels over the fireplace. What's, why this is a great example is you can see when this went out of fashion, they laughed and plastered right over it. You can see the lime stains from where that was plastered over. Um, same treatment here. So paneled walls, very typical. Um, before plaster becomes more available and, and more desirable really in the, in the federal period. And what's also noticeable is, is looking at the fireboxes, um, stone, you're not even seeing brick. Brick is something we'll discuss in a little while, but um, brick is hard to manufacture. It's not readily available at this time. So people are using stone as, as much as they can. Um, so we're looking, obviously, this is the kitchen. We see the bake oven in this house and, and one of the parlors. And, Really, as the 1780s move into the 1790s, this sort of treatment um, gives way really to, to smooth plaster, plaster surfaces. This is the previously mentioned uh, Flack House in the Belcher vicinity, uh, circa 1787 is, is the date um, I've seen for it. Now, it looks in every bit, some of the houses we've been looking at, but there is a, there, there, there's something about this house that's different, and I know a few of you have seen this talk, um, and it's this knee wall. Now, where this is not New England construction here. Now, if this is a New England cape, you know, your eave line is right there. This house has been bumped up to create a knee wall upstairs. Um, knee wall, and we're going to look at a picture, is when you're upstairs um, in an attic where the posts rise up above the floor to the, to the, to the plate where the rafters come down, as opposed to in a New, New England house, the rafters would go right down to floor level. Knee wall is created by the extension of the post 
above the, the level of the, of the ceiling beams. So this is conspicuous as something that in the way it's built, in the way it's laid out in the center chimney and pretty much everything about the house, it looks New England, but it's that half story, it's that story and a half that tells us that, that ideas have started to mingle. This is not a New England house. It is in most ways, this has Dutch influence or New World Dutch influence. We see these in Western Vermont. You see them in Western Massachusetts. Ideas are being exchanged. You, you yeah. My mom has the exact same house. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's conspicuous and it's something that's happening, um, like I say, builders uh, who might be of, of New England persuasion or, or people of New England background who are, who are asking for a house to be built have seen this feature and want it. Um, but like I say, it's a deviation from our New England, pure New England house type that's happening in areas where you have communication with, with Dutch and German culture, people who build that knee wall type house. We don't know how early people are doing this. Um, I'm going to show you a house in a second that um, my wife and I are, 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 are about to dismantle, hopefully, if it doesn't collapse first, uh, which shows this influence. Yeah, let's actually go uh, right to that. Uh, the Gifford House in Pittstown, it's, it's the same exact affair. It's, it's a knee wall cape, as we'll say, or a raised wall cape, built about 1800. Um, the Gifford family, who still are eighth generation on this land, came out of Amenia in the 1790s Quakers settled and farmed this land, have continuously ever since. Their second period dwelling is probably this Cape House, a 40 by 30 knee wall Cape House. 1867, they build their new house. And that's actually pretty late for this sort of Greek revival thing, but we know definitively from their own family records that's when it happened. They took the old Cape and they pushed it across the road and it was a barn ever since. Um, the building has deteriorated to the point of near collapse. So we are going to take this house down. Um, and rebuild it. That's our plan. But once again, it shows um, this, this, this sort of house we see in our region that you're not going to see in eastern New England until really the Greek Revival period. They just don't do this sort of thing there. Um, here's a picture of your knee wall right here. So we're upstairs. Here we can see the failure of this corner. This wall is starting to fall out. This building, I'm surprised this building made it as far as long as it has. So here's our floor level. And then we see you got about four feet of knee wall here. So it creates much more usable space. So that's up to about here, as opposed to having your rafters go into the floor, which makes you have to move your wall over even more. And also the roof frame. I mean, these common rafters with what are called collar ties, closely spaced, very Dutch looking to me. So we don't know, is this a Dutch or German builder who has seen this house type? and wants to build it, or is this a, a New England builder who has absorbed these principles? One thing we do know is this house type existed where these people were coming from already. It's down in Dutchess County. There was plenty of exposure to the Dutch culture as well. Um, but it's just a variant. And like I say, it's a hybrid form. It represents the convergence of these two building traditions. All right, um, think back to um, the Wilson House, 1787. Um, because we're looking at something that's really pretty sophisticated in, in comparison. And this is uh, the Payne House in, in Fort Miller, uh, built in 1787. Uh, we, we know that definitively because um, two of the bricks are dated, I think three of them, dated before they were fired. Notice on the gable end, this patterned brickwork, really wonderful. Um, Asa Fitch wrote of this house, I think it particularly said that the, the brick was laid up in the old mode with diamond panels on the wall. Um, we're very fortunate. Well, we, we, we know who built this house, and we'll talk about him in a second, which is rare because a lot of these buildings we're looking at are the work of anonymous people, just everyday builders or people whose names have been lost um, in, in the mists of time. But this is a building that we can um, um, connect to a particular person. What we see is the, the, the center chimney is gone. What we have is a full center hall house. The fireplaces have been pushed out to the end walls, much more formal house. Suddenly, you don't walk into a cramped space. You open up into a very formal hallway with parlors off of it. Um, just really very sophisticated by comparison. Brick, brick is not something that um, you just go down to the local brickyard and get. This house is made of brick that's fired and made on the site. This is just a closer view of the patterning. Uh, this, this really complex logic that creates these. It really is tour de force. We have a few of these, and we're going to look at a few others. I think there's a total of five we've seen, four in Washington County, one actually in, in Saratoga County, 
We think they're all by the same mason and brick maker. What's interesting is the houses are all very different otherwise, but this is definitely a signature, this particular, we'll call brick bond or diapering. Yeah, well, well, part of it is, well, no, yeah, they're, they're, they're different sizes, but you, you see there is variation. What happens is, okay, the, the brick is, is basically tempered and, and molded, it's, it's air dried, and then it's fired. How they fire the brick is what they call a scove kiln. You basically build up a, a kiln with the brick itself, and then you fire it from the inside. So what happens invariably, some brick is too close to the fire, that gets dark, those are the clinkers. Some are too pale, because they're, they're, they're the salmon colored stuff. And then you have really the best stuff. But he, he seems to have put a few clinkers in here along the way, you know, um, to, to call out certain things. And we're gonna look at uh, uh, the, the wheelhouse or the wells house. That would usually be like a three wife, I think they would say, or with wall, yeah. Yeah, so that actually it has to be keyed in. So this is only obviously, uh, this, this header here goes in two and then there has to be a third. And they're, they're still in production. Yeah, that, those I can't recall if we measured them. Um, yeah, they're a little smaller. They're not small as some of the stuff you see. This is the great part about this house is um, July 14th, 1786. So we, we know it's, he inscribes that before the brick is fired. So all the brick is probably made in 1786 then the building campaigns, probably 1787. And here's our guy, Jaheel Robin, or Jaheel Robbins. Um, I've done some research on him, and um, yeah, fascinating. He, he comes from a tradition of brick making from uh, Wethersfield, Connecticut. Um, what we know about him is uh, that it appears that his, from what I was able to find out, there, there's a very early brick church in Wethersfield, Christ Church, built in the 1760s. Connecticut is not a state that has a big tradition of brick construction. Wethersfield is one place that did. We know that his father-in-law was the brick maker and the overseer of that building. So by extension, you say maybe he's an apprentice to his father-in-law. Somehow he learns this trade. Now we, we were asking ourselves, is he a mason? Is he the brick maker? Is he both? Our conclusion is he's both, um, which, which happens from time to time. He is probably both the brick maker and the brick mason. You find that duality sometimes, but you have to be careful in the, that interpretation too. Um, the other house that, that has this bond, which is right in this area, and conceptually in the way it's built and, and laid out much different, is the Edmund Wells house right on Turnpike Road, just south of Cambridge. Um, and, and the definitive feature obviously is that, that what's been called the wheel, which is uh, basically made out of clinker brick, burnt brick right on the facade. It's been interpreted as a wheel. I, I think it's a St. Andrew's cross myself. That's my take on it. It is unusual. And we don't have a lot of this sort of patterned brick stuff in Washington County. You see that more uh, in parts of the Hudson Valley, uh, parts of Southern New Jersey. Um, there's a great tradition of, of Quaker brick houses down there, but it's just not stuff we see too often. It's probably the only one I, I, I think that, that we have that has some sort of motif made. And let's, let's home in on that. Yeah, and you can see he's even molded the bricks, you know, um, that he needed here. You know, these, these are molded that way where they have that little tail. And this is all just clinker, burnt brick. And here we see that pattern as well. And when you look at the facade, you can't see it. But you see on the end elevation, you can see that diamond pattern. And all these houses are built in a span of about five or six years. You mean in terms of style or in terms of? I just saw this. Yeah, you know, I, I, it's hard really to define that stylistically because there really aren't that many indicators of style on it. That's, that's one thing, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Alan. We shouldn't always try to define things by style because sometimes they're just not style. You could say, I, I try to define it by the form and then say it has this or that detail. But really, as we saw, it has very subdued detail. It just has that small sort of denticulated cornice you go inside late Georgian woodwork. Um, and while we're, we're looking at Robbins, um, the famous state line house, the um, Colonel, is it? No, Captain David Matthews. That house has the same bond work. Um, the Whiteside house in Cambridge has the same brickwork. And the Garncy house in Clifton Park has this bond work. Um, and they're all built in like a six or seven year span. Um, 
it's just such an unusual bond. I haven't seen it anywhere else. When you see that sort of thing, it seems like a signature of one person. It's possible it's a couple guys who work together or an apprentice picks it up. We don't know enough about it now, but five of these houses with this very distinctive bond type is, is what we found. Chief Satterthwaite's house, the, the McNish house, uh, 1794. I'm sure you've seen its, its companion, uh, the Savage house, which is right down Route 22. Um, really pretty much the same house. I wouldn't doubt if those houses were being built concurrently. That's not an impossible notion because uh, you look every bit uh, houses that are built by the same person. Now, this isn't a great view to show it, but um, one of the signature features of this is a gambrel roof, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. Uh, bond work is Flemish bond, which is just alternating headers and stretchers in a vertical pattern. Um, really wonderful thing about this house is, is really the history as much as the McNish family. Um, they were some of the first to import the merino uh, species of um, sheep into Washington County from uh, the nursery, I think the Prince Nursery in Long Island. And they were so concerned about protecting the sheep and they weren't sure how um, they would fare in the winter. So for the first winter, these sheep were housed in the basement kitchen of the house. We know that, it's been passed down, Asa Fitch writes about it. Um, you have an actual basement kitchen here, accessible at grade here, right through this, this large um, uh, gable elevation there. Great story, I mean, some of the, I, Asa Fitch, I mean, we should just do a talk on him because the, the material and the things he recorded for us are just remarkable. Um, so a very formal house too. So suddenly we have another brick house, 1794. We're, we're transitioning. We're heading towards, you know, uh, the turn of the century. The gambrel roof. A lot of people have called that house Dutch. Yeah, it looks Dutch. It looks like the stuff uh, we see in Albany. To me, it's really a very thoroughly English house, both in terms of the way it's built, in terms of the way it's laid out, in terms of the, uh, the, the way the brick is done. And just so you know, even up to the Knickerbocker Mansion, um, if you've ever driven around in Columbia County, you've seen the Van Allen house or some of these early Dutch brick houses. Those are not load-bearing walls. The Dutch build a timber frame and they put a brick veneer around it. Very different. The English build a load-bearing structure. Knickerbocker Mansion is that same building system. And probably the reason it survived is that brick is a veneer. It's built in the old Dutch way, basically with a full structural timber frame core and the brick is just a veneer around it. So you see it, and clearly they were making pretensions to a sort of English Georgian house, but they were still building it in sort of the Dutch, Dutch manner. This is a Schenectady house, wonderful Dutch, you know, gambrel roofed house. Um, what I want to show is really the differences, even in just the appearance of the gambrel. New England gambrel, usually in, in terms of the way it's built, leads to almost an equal sized upper and lower pitch. The way the Dutch build their gambrel, they break very high high up on the ridge, there's just a little slope and then the rest of it swings down. The lower Hudson Valley, we know these come out to sort of extended eaves, that iconic sort of Rockland and Bergen County, New Jersey sort of house. But my point being that the, the gambrel roof, we, we know what a Dutch colonial is. The gambrel roof is not Dutch, the gambrel roof is English. It is just not a Dutch form. What happens, uh, a friend of mine, Wally Wheeler, who works for Harkin, uh, Archaeological Associates, became so uh, obsessed with discovering well, how, how does the gambrel wind up here um, right after, uh, really during the French and Indian War and immediately after builders from Boston are coming here. They've built fortifications in Albany, then they're coming back and they're building houses for the wealthy Dutch families, the Schuylers, the Van Rensselaers, the people who want to affiliate themselves with Dutch culture, with English culture, excuse me. So it's really, that's how it's introduced into the upper Hudson Valley through Boston, Massachusetts builders. It is not a Dutch thing, which is funny because when you think of a gambrel, you see either a Dutch colonial, the gambrel comes to mind, or when people say a Dutch barn, <laughs> they see the gambrel roof barn, obviously. That is not a Dutch barn. Uh, interior finishes of Sheaf's house. This is really a period of transition. We're starting to see a little bit more plaster. The paneling is still there. But really within five or so years, um, a new revolution is gonna sweep through um, you know, our, our neck of the woods and then really throughout the country. And that's gonna be the federal style, which is gonna start to break down sort of quirky regionalisms. Um, so this is real, it's really the tail end of what we say the Georgian period. Georgian is not a style, it's a period. And a lot of things happen in this period. It's basically the reigns of all the Georges. So when you describe something as Georgian, it's, it's really more a time period than a style. Just to make the point, we're, we're looking at, at, at a lot of architecture that is, is some of its high style, some of its folk. 
there's plenty of building types that really haven't, we haven't examined. I, I just had this conversation with someone. Uh, we recently looked at some buildings in, in Boston and Charlton, and some of the stuff did have Dutch influence. You still see stuff that you haven't seen before. I mean, it truly is a uh, lifetime endeavor. You're always going to see something you've never seen. I mean, what is this? It has a massive sort of central chimney stack, but it looks sort of New World Dutch with the gable and the lean-to built into it. I, that, I, that I can guarantee no longer survives. But just to say that there are other house types out there that, that we haven't seen or assessed before. This you still see in the landscape, though, not so much with that uh, prominent chimney stack, but that house type. All right, now we, we're getting... Uh, into the, the, the big revolution here. I've always sort of marveled at how this uh, uh, federal doorway in Connecticut could in some way relate to a wall mosaic in Herculaneum. I mean, it's sort of peculiar, but you see the similarity, especially in that sort of fan treatment. Obviously, uh, Joe Carpenter here in, in Fairfield County uh, doesn't really know a lot about Herculaneum or Pompeii or Roman ruins. So the question is, how does he know about this stuff? And it's it's really through the dissemination of information uh, from England to America and eventually really the, the builder's guides of uh, Asher Benjamin, uh, certainly. The Country Builder's Assistant is published in 1797. It starts to promote this sort of Roman classicism that's already very popular in England. We're sort of a generation behind. Um, but like I say, it's, it's fascinating because the last material you would ever invoke, uh, try to build a uh, Roman architecture would be wood. This is a classical. So it's funny, this translation into American arch folk architecture, you know, is, is fascinating. But federal style is, is Roman in derivation. The proportions, the details, everything about it is a borrowing of, of Roman architecture. Um, and it is Benjamin. His book, uh, 1797, uh, although it's called The Country Builder's Assistant, it, it's used everywhere. It's used in cities. It's used... Um, it, it is one of the, if, if I was going to name maybe the three most influential architectural books in American architectural history before the Civil War, that's probably one of them. It's also the first book that's published in America by an American author, and he's basically taken this English stuff and he's translated it into, an, um, in a way that basically your country builder can understand. He is himself a builder who has turned an architect. He's been a builder, a rural builder before, so he understands the peculiar needs so he's really the disseminator of, of what we now call the federal style, um, which, is, which is a Roman style. What's the date on that doorway? Yeah, that, that I don't have. This is from the Historic American Building Survey, maybe a little before 1800, I would guess. It still has a little bit of a chunkiness to it, but definitely federal in that, that over, over treatment. And how did the two pictures get connected? I, um, I made the connection. I was looking, I said, I've seen that somewhere. And I, I just put them together at some point and said, this is odd. But it, it tells you quite a bit, doesn't it? It really does. What a change. What a change. One of my favorite houses. And I, I date this to 1797. I've seen it dated to 1790, which I think is pretty early. Um, right here in Salem, this is one of the most sophisticated houses this county sees. I mean, it's really sort of, it, it is a transitional house. It's, it's really sort of Georgian period in terms of being a big square hipped roof house. This projecting center pavilion with the, the gable motif. House has you know, a lot of stature, a very noble edifice. Um, so although it has that sort of form of what we'd expect from an 18th century house, the detail in this thing is federal, and that starts to tell me something. This parlor um, in this front room is, is really just spectacular. A lot of this is not carved work. Um, this is composition ornament. Um, what they start to realize is, you know, sitting and, and crafting all this finely wrought detail is, is not um, efficient. Um, so this is made typically in molds with, um, I think they use uh, like glue and resin and sawdust and basically make these motifs, mass produce them. Um, our, our most famous wood carver probably of the early 19th century, Samuel McIntyre in Salem, Massachusetts. Uh, his work became so popular that he also turned to compo ornament. So even the best wood carver of the day saw the merits of doing this. This is an exceptionally sophisticated house. See all these Roman motifs. You got the muses, you got the garlands, you got the urn. You know, this detail here with the little incurved corners. It's just, it's great. That's all I can say about it. It's just a remarkably sophisticated house. 
really one of our other sort of grand houses of the period. And, and once again, these are probably from the very late 1790s, uh, is the door house. Same concept, big hipped roof house. Doesn't have the center pavilion. This house, though, has some of the most finely rendered exterior detail um, from this period. Um, really, really spectacular. If you get up close and see this house, it really, just that, that the finery of it is just spectacular. I noticed, you know, a, a pretty clear resemblance to a Plate Nash or Benjamin's book. I said, yeah, you know, it, it has the massing. It has, you know, some of the features. There's some obvious deviations. But when we got inside the house and started to look um, at some of the other details, mantle, staircase, it became pretty clear that this house did come from this book in some way, that this builder or the Finnish carpenter joiner uh, was familiar with this book, with the country builder's assistant. Now, this is what has always got me about these two houses. I can probably get them confused here. Blanchard Williams, door house. Identical cornices. I mean, they're really almost to a T. Uh, you, you put them together and they're, they're seamless. Now, this really strikes me as the work of a single builder. Um, who that builder is, though, remains hard to know. We know Door was William's doctor, I believe. They were very close. Social connections are certainly really important in architecture. Oh, well, so-and-so just, oh, well, maybe he'll do this for me. So whether the house rights the same, we don't know, but certainly whoever's executing this finish work, man, this stuff is really uh, pretty, pretty close. There's a relation I haven't fleshed out between these buildings, pretty clear. We talked about how a lot of these guys are anonymous. Um, I just told the story, I was lucky right before I was here, I was up in the roof frame of the Presbyterian Church here, which is a real tour de force of, of carpentry. And I've had some theories. One day during lunch, I, I scanned the old newspaper. Salem newspapers are online. They're accessible even from before 1800. Just go and find stuff. I start reading a story. At the celebration of 4th of July at Salem, Caleb Fisher and Timothy White were killed by the bursting of a field piece, which had been uh, partly filled with stones and said by some thoughtless persons. Here's this guy, you know, 29, killed at the 4th of July Salem celebration. I mean, this is awful. I actually got the court case that's in the county records, and the person was eventually exonerated. This story was picked up in New York City and in other papers because it just, it's just one of those grim stories. So I said, who the, who the heck is Caleb Fisher? Found a stone um, in the cemetery here. It's called a mechanic of unusual ingenuity. A mechanic is a term for a builder at, at, at this time. And I see this ad. He places joiners wanted. Subscriber wants to hire a number of joiners. February 1798. He's building something big because he's looking for journeymen to help him. This is how it works. He looks like he's a master builder. He needs help. So you put an ad for journeyman joiners to come and work with you. The hierarchy, master builder, journeyman, apprentice. This guy's building stuff here. I'm dying to find out who he is. And yeah, you know, whether it's, uh, yeah, he knows uh, Williams. He's, he's a member of the church here. He might have built the church. But um, this, this guy was somebody pretty young, though, for, um, you should read the stone. I mean, really um, considered with the highest regard. But um, 29, yeah. right? Yeah, 1770, 1799. Yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was in his honor by the, the local lodge here that, that had that stone cut for him. So he was held in very high regard, but who he is, still don't know. A couple others, um, McLean House in Battenville, which is built in 1796, you know, later Greek Revival Wing. This is very, you see this typically for a kitchen with that sort of recessed porch using the entablature and the pilasters. What's interesting about this house is it, it shows a, a type that becomes common after 1800. Two stories, usually gable-ended, center hall, you know, pretty standard fare. You know, obviously that the fireplaces have been moved to the outside. What's fascinating about this was it was a hipped roof house, and that hipped roof is still embedded in this gable they put on in the Greek Revival period. And there's other examples of these. There's one in uh, Northeastern with the hipped roof. There's one in Granville with it. Um, so just another type, but it's funny that, that, that they've just built over that roof and the frame is still there. They, they wanted a Greek revival. They, 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 they were up on the times. Now, a few in, interior details and say, well, what's that? That's a Dutch door. Well, you should always say it's a divided door because this isn't a Dutch house and these aren't Dutch people. Yet they're using that, that device. It's actually a great thing. It's, it's a really convenient thing. 
surface mounted hardware, as you can see, pre, you know, butt hinges. Um, built in the late 1790s, the McLean family bought it, I think about 1807. Um, great fireplace mantle upstairs. Uh, Livingston House in East Greenwich, uh, Patty and Mark Westner's place. Um, just showing that this continued use of the story and a half house. See, it's very linear too. It's very long, no end gabled, so linear footprint. Um, what's great about this house is you actually walk in and the way it was arranged was interesting because you walk in on one side, there's a parlor and immediately on the right side is a kitchen. And uh, you know, this, this survives entirely, the fire back, the bake oven with the little hood on it. So one of the front rooms was actually given over to a kitchen, which is sort of unusual. It's, it's very informal to my mind uh, to have that sort of arrangement. Uh, it's what it was. Um, I think Mark and I weren't, I think we had different stories. I don't think the wing on this house was original. I think this was just really that, that main block and no evidence of a, of a basement kitchen either. Mentioned Chamberlain Mills, and I'm, I'm glad you did because I wanted to show this. I don't know how many of you have ever driven by this house. It sits right there at the crossroads. Um, this could be after 1830, so maybe I'm violating my own uh, mandate here. Uh, but the reason I wanted to show it is, I'm going to look really carefully here. You see these? It's a stacked plank house. This house is built with stacked boards. Very unusual building technology. The, the schoolhouse in East Hebron is built the same way, and there's a couple other examples of this. This is being built this way because obviously they have a lot of wood here to use, but this is uh, known as board wall construction. Um, it's advocated for in the 1840s in one particular book, but basically you're just laying up planks and you're pinning them from the top, putting the next one on. It's just a solid wall of plank. Very unusual house type. If you stop, just look, and you'll, you'll, you'll it's, You'll eventually see it. Are they laying a side and over the edge? Yeah, and then they're just the nailing it over. What they do is sometimes on the inside, they, they stagger the boards and they, they plaster directly into that. By staggering the boards inside, they basically have a place for the plaster to key. They don't even use lath. I think the schoolhouse had that detail. But what it's saying is this, this is vernacular architecture at its best. It's a response to the immediate conditions and the fact they probably have all sorts of just boards that aren't what they call good, clear stuff that they're willing. It's just refuse. I mean, they're running off so many boards. Just a cheap, easy way to build a house. This might be later. It could be 1830s, 1840. I don't know. It has a look of potentially being 1820s. Don't know. Haven't gotten in it yet. Would love to see um, a little more of that house. So. Yeah, there was a huge sawmill there. Absolutely, it's a big mill. Well, it would just be water powered, hydraulic. Yeah, everything's just hydraulic. Yeah, what do you? Okay, let's let's talk about your insulation options. Um, in the house that I showed you that we were going to dismantle, it was a plank house. So basically, you had a two-inch piece of plank. You had clabbered outside. You had lath inside and plaster. That's your whole wall. I cannot even believe people made it on that sort of house. The other option is you sometimes see brick nogging, where brick either fired or unfired is laid up in the wall cavity. Um, how this fares in terms of our value or insulation by comparison, I'm not sure. Um, good question. Knickerbocker House has brick nogging, and it's, it's unfired. They don't even bother. They just, they just air dry the brick, and they just use it in the wall. And we haven't looked at too many uh, stone houses, and we haven't really looked at too many things up in, uh, up in the northern uh, reaches of the county. Um, the Shipman Swift House, about 1825, that's as I dated it from what I could find out. Beautiful. It's actually Potsdam sandstone, which uh, there's a vein of which comes down into our region and stops pretty much there. A quarry was opened up and a, a series of houses were built, it looks like, in a short period of time here using this material. It is not, it's, it's pretty hard stone for something that's called a sandstone. It's not easily worked. Um, you see more stone houses, you get up um, on 22A into the Champlain Valley, um, into Vermont, but we, we really don't have the same tradition of, of stone architecture as other parts did. Probably one of the reasons, other than maybe not having uh, qualified masons to do this sort of work or, or, or easy access to quarries, is we just had so much good timber here. Virgin, you know, white pine, and white oak, everywhere. I mean, just the best possible building materials in terms of it just drove timber framing. I mean. It's interesting, we should have noted that both the door and the Blanchard Williams houses are frame houses and they really could have been built uh, of brick. And another one just from the Historic American Building Survey to show that someone in this brief window of time, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in Fort Ann was, was building these. And finally, I, I'll, I'll leave us at, at the Ransom Stiles house. Um, 
I've seen this dated to 1820. I, I see it closer to 1830. Um, here we have something that's really pretty darn urbane. This is a house that if you put this in Lansingburg at that time, you put this house in Albany at that time, this house holds its own. It's a very sophisticated. It's really a townhouse uh, in a lot of ways. Parapet ended, beautiful cut sandstone, uh, Greek motif stuff. Actually, this stuff appears on the Coyla Church too, which is built, I think, 1831, 32, somewhere thereabouts. Brick house, unusual sort of four bay arrangement. When you go inside, really just these are finishes you would see, as I say, in the best class of houses in Albany, Lansingburg. Beautiful grain doors, either rosewood, maybe mahogany. Um, these are what they call raffle flowers, you know, trimming the architraves, the mantles. This stuff is really very late federal. It's starting to assume sort of Greek revival feeling in its simplicity. Um, no more of that fancy sort of finicky stuff. It's, it's really a transitional period into the Greek revival. That's sort of happening gradually. And that's a brick wall. We've hit the wall. <laughs> So I hope it was informative or entertaining and not terribly long, but I, let me, I just want to stress, there is some great stuff here. I spend probably as much time studying our barns and our agricultural buildings as houses and other buildings. Washington County, even with everything that's been lost, is, is phenomenal. There's just great vernacular architecture up here. And it's got the setting, it has the feeling too, and that, that, that lends a lot to it in terms of the evocative nature. Sometimes seeing buildings in a denatured setting, you don't really get quite the same feel. Here you get a lot of context with these buildings. Um, I, I, I would love eventually to, to author something on you know, the architecture of, of our, our region. If I live long enough, maybe I will, but it is special. I, I, having seen a lot of our state, this is definitely a, it's a great area can't reinforce that enough. And I can, if uh, probably some of you want to escape, I can hang around for a couple questions thank too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.